Hello everyone and welcome back to this channel of mine in which I talk about books. This time I thought I'd keep the pile of books down <coughs> to a more <laughs> manageable state, so I'm not talking about millions of books. I've got a, a bunch of paperbacks. This uh, video I think will have the theme of horror. I've been talking about some science fiction, I talked about Doctor Who. It'd be nice to talk about some horror fiction. I'm a massive horror fan. Um, I never really went in for the, the fandom and all of that stuff. And when I have <coughs> uh, the kind of fantasy, dark fantasy horror world, um, uh, it didn't seem quite for me somehow. I don't know. But I do love horror novels. And I began reading them from the earliest age, because again, they were books that were on the shelf at home, alongside Barbara Taylor Bradford and Catherine Cookson, and the Emmerdale Farm novelizations. There were also James Herbert and Stephen King, and all those wonderful fellas from the 70s, and M.R. James as well, of course, used to be on um, those shelves in book club editions, those kinds of books. Right, now, these are Things that come off my top shelf, they're the black spined books, <laughs> that end of the um, of the spectrum, and they're spooky. Now, I talked about The Fog the other day, um, and how much I love James Herbert and his Rats books. The one that, it's not to hand, it's next door, um, on my favourite, favourite shelf, <laughs> there's a hierarchy of favourite bookcases, but my favourite James Herbert is the first one. I read fully, and that was The Magic Cottage, when I was in my kind of mid-teens. I don't know what it was about that book. It could have been the fact that it just smelled of fags, because <laughs> it was second-hand and it reeked of cigarettes and the smell was intoxicating. But that couldn't have been the only reason. I love the story for itself, this mix of the domestic and the fantastic with spooky overtones. I love James Herbert and still do. And I think Fluke, which I've read a few times, is... Um, one of his best, if not the best, and such a strange book. The story of the the dog who thinks he's a man, or vice versa. Although I think it's plain in the book, which it is. It's not so much of a conundrum. I can't remember now. It's such a strange and wonderful book. And, and we got our book club people to read it a couple of years ago when we started book club again, and everybody loved it. I don't know if it's still in print. I hope it is. Right. More spooky. The Exorcist, of course, which is uh, just as good a book as it is a film, I think. It's very taut and dialogue heavy. William Peter Blatty. Um, I remember first seeing the video. And it was the one time I skived from school with three friends and we went, went round Colin's house. He lived near the video shop. And this was in the mid 80s when The Exorcist on video was, was a pirate. You couldn't get it. It had been banned in this country for years. And I, all I knew was that my Auntie Janice had uh, seen it in the pictures in 72 when she was very young, still a teenager, and she um, uh, couldn't sleep. She, <laughs> she kept herself awake. She was so scared of this film. And so we saw it alongside a very kind of soft core um, Italian mucky film also passed in a brown paper bag under the counter at the local video store in 1985. And we had this afternoon of watching uh, something saucy, which wasn't that saucy, very straight, very awful. Uh, and then The Exorcist, which scared the living daylights out of me. And the book still does, and the film still does. Fantastic. Um, uh, Planet of the Apes has ended up in there, the original novel. Monkey Planet by Pierre Boulle, not really a, a horror novel, but a fabulous novel and quite different to the film. I love all the films, I always did, uh, from being a kid. And the book, I um, I read, God, I bet it says inside, 2020. Oh, I read, <laughs> so when the pandemic struck, March 2020, I sat down and um, read Planet of the Apes in the impending apocalypse in case everything went really tits up. <laughs> That's hilarious. I think I also watched all of the BBC version of Day of the Triffids 
when lockdown began, I was kind of overdosing on apocalyptic futures. Crazy. There's a funny thing about, um, I've, got, I've got something marked up halfway through this book. Uh, it's when um, your hero is falling, he meets Nova, she's still in this, as she is in the, um, uh, the film, Charlton Heston's love interest, the mute lady. Uh, <laughs> for some reason I've underlined the line, I shared the she-monkey's gaiety. <clears throat> I <laughs> picked that out as the most significant line in the book. Now, to represent Stephen King, here's my copy of Skeleton Crew from the 80s, from, I guess, about 88 or something. It's a collection of short stories. No, it's 85, and I've had it since then. And the stories I liked are ticked. Isn't that just so civilised? Um, that's what you did with collections of stories. You tick the ones that were good to go back to. And the first one in this is The Mist. It's novella length. It's the one about everybody being trapped uh, in a supermarket with monsters and mist. And, and it was adapted into a really good film, a very bleak film and a terrible TV show that forgot everything that was good about The Mist, namely The Mist, <laughs> the characters and the fact they were trapped in a supermarket. TV show did everything other. I think people in charge of TV shows have no sense sometimes. They have no sense of what it is that made something good in the first place, especially when they're remaking things, or they want to make their mark and subvert everybody's expectations and do something different when really what they should be doing is just concentrating on what was fantastic about the story in the first place and the fact that they're trapped in a supermarket and there's monsters outside and they're being picked off one at a time is all you need. It's it's a perfect base under siege story, as Doctor Who fans call these things. Many of these stories in this collection are great. I do love Stephen King. I like his short stories. I With his novels, there are about three that I really like. The earliest ones that I read, his kind of late 70s, early 80s period. With his other novels, it's like the first 50 pages are fantastic. And then it's the next 400 pages I have a problem with. They just go on and on and on. Fairy tale. I fell for it again. I bought the hardback thinking this is going to be marvellous. First 50 pages really were. Maybe the first 100 pages. But once he gets into the actual fairy tale place, just bollocks, really. <laughs> well, um, was it bollocks? Yes, it was. Right, the Sentinel. I think I mentioned uh, Jeffrey Convitz before. This is the one that comes before that was adapted into a, a film where people with um, uh, things wrong with them physically and lesbians are the enemy <laughs> and the emissaries, emissaries of Satan. It's just dreadful, dreadful. The lesbians who live downstairs, just awful, but schlocky in that kind of 70s way. There used to be a wonderful uh, blog by somebody called, was it Kurt Purcell, in the early 2000s, called The Groovy Age of Horror. And he talked about that very tacky era of the 70s and 80s within horror, which um, seems so politically incorrect now in so many ways, and it was, but has a kind of certain cachet and, and charm to it. Um, from that time, Deadpan by T.A. Shock. And I read this 13 years ago. In a gloomy seaside house, Keel and his loving ex-wife had only one visitor, her dead mother. <laughs> Daniel Keel is a pushy New York City press agent who often regrets his good-hearted bent to help others out of a jam. This time it's his ex-wife, Gracie, whose trouble could cost Keel his sanity. Uh, yes, it's a psychic group and mystery, and blood, and Florida, and fi the final terror. It's a series. He's a mystery. Uh, he's a sleuth, a spooky sleuth. I love this. It's one of those ones that I will return to. Um, I do like tacky books, don't I? Not so tacky. The Nightmare Man by Daniel Wiltshire. 
And this became a wonderful TV show uh, that felt very like a kind of adult version of Doctor Who. It had lots of the same people involved in it as late 70s Doctor Who. The people who'd made the, the great gothic Tom Baker stories left that show, left Who, and they made things like Nightmare Man, which is set on a Scottish island, remote, wonderful cast, very spooky location filming. And it's all about some kind of mutant um, Russian soldier fused with his own um, submarine, I think. It's some kind of um, futuristic thing in the end. But he's like a monster who goes around killing bird watchers and old ladies on this island. And it's a great story. And the book is just as good. My friend Steve Cole, who was my editor and also a fellow Doctor Who writer and kids writer, knew David Wiltshire, um, I think, because I think he was a dentist as well. And a very modest man. I think uh, they lived in the same village or something. Anyway, apparently he, uh, I think he lent Steve his VHS of the, t of the show before it came out on video and DVD and stuff. And he'd f kind of managed to fit all the episodes on one VHS tape by cutting out the credits. And to, to Steve, that was such a mark of modesty that he didn't even have the whole show. He'd cut out his own credit to fit it on one tape. I think that's the story he told me. I thought it was very touching. Fearfully Frightening by Barbara Ierson. Now, she was an anthologist who did lots of these books. I probably have more of them down here. Hold on. More spooky. Yeah. Oh, God, there's loads. <laughs> I'm exceeding my own self-imposed limit on these. She did lots of them. And hang on. Haunting Tales is the classic one. Look at that, for 70s puffin perfection. Was it 70s or early 80s anyway? 73. She was a really good anthologist, I think. Again, mixing up that, you know, the really old, the Edwardian, the J.B. Priestleys and M.R. James and H.G. Wells with the more modern. Um, Barbara Softly, she's got in this. These are books to bring out over the kind of the course of Halloween over October, November. But of course, you dip into them at other times of years as well. These are, are her other ones published by Beaver Books, which were uh, alongside Piccolo, just as as popular and everywhere, just as omnipresent as penguins, as, as puffins were. We remember puffin books, but the kids from that time do remember Beaver Books and uh, Piccolo. That's another Barbara Ierson. Thirteen macabre tales chosen. Ghostly and ghastly. Yep, more M.R. James, more Barbara Softly, uh, Ray Bradbury, Oscar Wilde. The Canterville Ghost for a bit of light relief. And The Haunted Doll's House by M.R. James. Creepy Creatures. That's a great... Have a look at that monster with his eyes so close together. <clears throat> um, yep, same kind of people. Patricia Highsmith, that's interesting. Theodore Sturgeon. It's interesting that these people, known for science fiction or known for um, fantasy, doing horror and vice versa, people moved between genres, especially in short story form. Haunting Tales, different cover. Uh, yeah, same book. And Fearfully Frightening. There's a funny one as well that's not to hand. This is a nice collection. Chosen by Kathleen Lines. House of the Nightmare. With a great cover. Puffin, I read this in October 2012. Uh, in Whitby, I remember. And I was writing uh, some Brenda stories while I was there. So this was a great uh, thing to put me in the mood for that. There are kind of true stories in this, true stories in this as well, uh, of ghostly goings on, as I remember. Yes, the book's divided into two parts, from imagination and then from life. Rosemary Sutcliffe is there. She was great. Alfred Hitchcock's Supernatural Tales of Terror and Suspense, published by Target. 
who did the Doctor Who books and many other great things besides. Um, and Famous Historical Mysteries, which I've talked about before, edited by Leonard Gribble. <clears throat> the thing I always look for, and you have to watch out for, is this book by Bernhard J. Herwood, Vampires, Werewolves and Other Demons, in Target Books. I've always looked for that. I think it's quite pricey. Um, yeah, here's Patricia Highsmith again, a Muriel Spark. Um, quite classy, really, this. There's something about giant slugs. Obviously, he's on the front. <laughs> but there's a giant slug story that's very good in that. And Aidan Chambers' Haunted Houses. Now, I think everybody had a copy of this. I think it must have been in one of the Scholastic Book Club things. Piccolo True Adventures. This is Jeremy's copy with his name written so carefully inside. I seem to have snaffled it from um, his collection of books. I must give it back to him. I think he loved this. Jeremy loved books, um, spooky books. He had many of the pan books of horror. When he was a kid, I never had them. They always seemed slightly too frightening. Uh, anything else to hand that's spooky? I'm not sure. Maybe I've talked enough. Uh, there's the Armada ghost books, but I think I talked about them and the monsters, didn't I, earlier. Maybe that will do for the day. Point Horror, it's Teddy Sparkles. Point Horror, um, something that my sister loved. And these collections are stunning, I think, because they were the British writers of Point Horror. And there were people... Very classy writers like Susan Price, Malcolm Rose, Gary Kilworth, who turns up in many of the science fiction collections I like, Lisa Tuttle, um, yeah, Colin Greenland, who, who wrote um, one of my favourite science fiction novels, John Gordon. Now, he is a really kind of slightly obscure, but a writer in the vein of Susan Cooper and Alan Garner, and he's got a handful of books that people who love them really love them. He did the um, Giant in the Snow, which is set in Norwich at Christmas, and it really gets that feel somehow. Um, so these are really worth looking out for. Whenever you see point uh, collections, whatever genre, that are by the British writers, they're really worth looking at. <clears throat> and um, I've met some of them as well over the years. Susan Price, we... Um, we shared a publisher at one point, and we were both treated quite badly by said publisher, uh, as we discussed over dinner that we were being taken out to by the publisher on the very day, I think, that um, either I'd been dropped by the publisher or she had. Anyway, she was extremely nice, and her books are fantastic. OK, I'm going to um, stop there. I'm looking now behind you at the shelves at various... Horror books I should and could have mentioned, like Ramsey Campbell's Ancient Images, which is a kind of Wicker Man story, in a way, about a rural community and uh, the bread that they make being suffused by the blood of sacrificial victims and how this woman gets drawn into the story, into this remote place, and it involves filmmaking and a kind of spy story. It's very violent. I read it, I think, when it came out, and I think it was from the library, and I managed to snag a library copy, ex-library copy from eBay in recent years, and reread it again. I think in the beginning of lockdown, <laughs> when I clearly was reading the most harrowing books I could find, um, possibly to make me feel better about the things going on in the real world. If I read um, spooky and apocalyptic things going on in books, I guess the reasoning was it would make me feel better. <laughs> I've just seen Guy N. Smith up there, um, Caracal, which is his cat book, his his big cat book, in the genre of, you know, when animals go bad, brilliant subset of horror. And he, um, he of course, wrote the Crabs series of books, which, oh, they'll be somewhere. I don't think they're together in one clump, a <laughs> clump of books. <laughs> um, uh, they're schlocky, they're funny. Um, I think they're done with great humour, but they're violent and, and uh, bloody 
and occasionally rude and I really like them. I think he's a kind of unabashed um, pulp writer, that's what he is. And that's what horror fiction people appreciate, I think. Those blurred lines between um, tacky and pulp and classy. And I think um, horror fiction always straddles those things because it's tacky and it's camp and it's silly, but it's horrifying as well. Right, that's enough for horror today. Socks is asleep down there on my chair, so I'm going to have to reclaim my reading chair at some point, but I will uh, urge you to like and subscribe wherever those buttons appear on the screen and to leave comments and let me know about uh, what you like in in this particular spooky genre. Okay, see you soon in the next episode. Bye-bye.